As a professional chain reaction artist, I often get asked for advice from builders who are just starting out. Maybe they have to build a Rube Goldberg machine for a science project, or maybe they're interested in joining a Rube Goldberg contest, or maybe they've stumbled across the active and flourishing online chain reaction community and were inspired to try building a machine themselves. Whatever the case, the questions are usually the same. How do I get started? What do I need to know before I start building? Where can I find information on how to improve and learn? If that sounds like you, first and foremost, my advice would be to watch a ton of machines for inspiration. There is an entire community of builders on YouTube, all of whom have unique and distinct styles. But don't stop there. Think about what you like and what you don't like. Do you like complexity or simplicity? Do you like a more compact machine or a more spread out machine? Do you like a machine that uses lots of custom chain reaction objects? You know, <laughs> or one that uses more everyday household objects. Once you've seen lots of different machines from lots of different artists representing lots of different styles, hopefully you'll have a decent idea of the scope and the variety of what's out there in the world of chain reaction art. And once you get a decent idea of what you in particular like to see, that will really help you hone in on a specific style that you want to make. So that's the advice that I give to people. And I mean, it's all true. There's nothing wrong with it. It's all valid advice, but I always wish that I could refer people to a more complete overview of chain reaction essentials. Like someone had written the book, so to speak, on chain reaction art and created like the definitive resource that listed all the fundamental techniques of machines. So I made it myself. This series will be split into five episodes, each one focusing on a specific subcategory of mechanism. And each episode will feature 10 mechanisms. In this episode, we'll be going over the basics. In subsequent episodes, we'll take a look at basic connects techniques, string techniques, advanced connects techniques, and weight management. I've done my best to order the mechanisms within each episode and the episodes themselves in order of increasing difficulty but the list as a whole is not necessarily sorted that way. For instance, the easiest weight management technique is still easier than the most advanced string technique. No need to worry though, I'll be indicating the difficulty of each mechanism as we go. A few things I want to mention before we get into it. First of all, these are not tricks. This is not a 50 chain reaction ideas video. Simply put, these are ways to make things happen in machines. These are the basic fundamental mechanisms that serve as building blocks that allow you to accomplish any idea that you come up with. This is the complete Chain Reaction Artist's Toolkit. It's a virtually comprehensive list of the techniques that I use in nearly every machine. Secondly, my style of building is not representative of other builders' styles. So while yes, I will be demonstrating each of these mechanisms the way that I would build them, that's not the only way. Understand that these mechanisms can be applied in any context, at just about any scale, using just about any materials. And ultimately, like, that's the point of this series. Like, I don't want it to be just, like, 50 little flashcards for you to study. Like, you want to get to a point where you can pull out any one of these 50 mechanisms from your mental toolkit at a moment's notice, like it's second nature. That's true mastery. That's what you want to get to. All right, let's begin. So, the existential threat to any chain reaction machine is running out of potential energy. So, some of the first things you learn as a chain reaction artist are methods of continually maintaining potential energy, or at the very least, never running out completely. And oftentimes, potential energy comes in the form of height. As a general rule, the higher an object is, the more potential energy it has. So, some of the most useful techniques in all of chain reaction art are methods of getting from a place of low height to a place of high height, essentially instantly renewing your supply of potential energy, all with one very simple motion. And I'm sure some of you probably already know where we're going with this, but that's exactly where we're going to begin, with mechanism number one, the weight and string. So let's start with the classic example. You've got a domino at the edge of a table connected to a string. When the domino gets pushed off the table, it pulls the string, releasing another ball from a higher surface. Of course, the weight doesn't have to fall from the edge of a table, it just has to fall from any tall surface, but if that tall surface is in the middle of the machine, you 
do have to be mindful about where the weight will land and maybe put a cup there or something. But let's say you've run into a problem. The domino that you're using isn't strong enough to pull the string. Well, up until this point, I've been referring to this mechanism as a weight and string. And uh, here's where that distinction comes in because you can replace that weight with anything. In this case, we're gonna make it heavier. And you might find that you need an even heavier weight for whatever you're doing. That's totally fine. At the end of the day, you're really only limited by the strength of the object that's pushing it. And keep in mind, you can put stuff at the end of the string. If you're trying to release an object that's, let's say, a little bit hard to hold back with just the end of a string, you can attach something like a popsicle stick. This is my method of choice for holding back toy trains or toy cars. Or if you're having trouble with an object that's slipping down a slope, you can attach a rubber band to the end of the string. So here's where the world of the weight and string gets blown wide open and the possibilities become nearly endless. Once we introduce the idea that the weight doesn't have to hit the ground, then you can use it to pull on stuff, namely levers. Also, you can use the weight and string mechanism to pull a rolling or sliding object, in this case, a rolling platform. Just a piece of side advice here on string type. If you're going to use a really heavy weight and put the string under high tension, don't use yarn. It's gonna unravel, and then when you take the yarn out of tension, it's gonna coil and twist up and look like this. So invest in some higher quality string. You'll be happy that you did. But yeah, it really can't be overstated just how integral the weight and string mechanism is to chain reaction art. Like it revolutionizes the style and the flow of the machines that you're able to make. So yeah, this is definitely one to learn. That said though, a bit of a disclaimer, the weight and string mechanism is not a universal solution. Like it won't work in every situation. There are definitely times when having all this weight fall off a table and pull on the end of a string with one giant sudden jolt of energy is not necessary. And in fact, sometimes it's a problem. And we'll get to some solutions and alternatives in future episodes. I just wanted to put it out there that we'll get to that. One final thing about the weight and string, by its very nature, it's really fast. And mechanically it's super reliable, but you can't always count on the viewer to keep up. So I'm trying to keep this series to discussion of purely mechanics, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say that you want to be mindful about doing really long string pulls that traverse really wide gaps. It's just harder for the viewer to keep up. Number two, falling domino. The most basic form of the falling domino is the domino falls and hits something. Traditionally a ball. You'll notice here we're going from low to high in one simple motion. Sound familiar? Or a lever. Of course, the domino doesn't have to push anything as it falls, it can pull something. So attaching a string to the top of the domino and having that release something is also a very common usage. You can almost think of it as an alternate form of the weight and string mechanism. You may have noticed that I'm using a specialized connects module combined with a Kapla block to make this. And that's just my default setup for making falling dominoes, but I find it tremendously useful. Okay, let's look at some alternate forms of the falling domino. If you put a slope at the top of the domino, now you can have an object hit it when its path of motion is actually perpendicular to the direction that the domino will fall in. And similarly, you can put the slope on the object hitting it and that will accomplish a similar motion. Alternatively, you can think of the falling domino not as a source of energy, but as a method of holding back energy. If you add a little extending arm to the top of a domino and put an object behind it, well, now you've got a pretty great way of holding that object in place until the domino falls over although you will need a decently strong hinge to make this work. To take this one step further, you can add a lever into the mix and make one side of the lever much longer than the other. And this can hold back surprisingly heavy weights while maintaining minimal pressure on the domino itself, you know, so that it's still easy to topple when you want. So far, we've only looked at dominoes that get pushed over, but there's still tremendous potential in dominoes that are already pushed over or pre-toppled dominoes, if you will. If you've ever had the displeasure of working with golf balls or wiffle balls or anything with holes in it, you may have run into a situation where it won't roll even on a sloped track because it's just caught in the wrong position. This is extraordinarily annoying, but luckily there's a pretty good non-intrusive fix for it. And this is where our pre-toppled domino comes in because you can put one behind the ball and it will provide enough force to push it if it ever gets stuck. As a matter of fact, this also works with unsloped tracks using just about any ball. So if you're ever in a situation where a ball needs to start on an unsloped track, the pre-toppled domino might be a solution for you. Finally, if you attach a string to a pre-toppled domino, 
Well, now you've got an object that can be used to restore an object to its original position every time it's moved because you've got this falling domino that is constantly providing force in a specific direction. Number three, pusher. A pusher is a rod going through a hole and it's used as a connection between two other objects. So instead of maybe a ball hitting another ball, you use a pusher in between, or perhaps you use a pusher to knock over a domino. The pusher is pretty simple, but there are actually a couple of cool things you can do with it. For instance, you can use the rounded surface of the ball and actually get away with putting the pusher perpendicular to the rolling path of the ball. And there is an advantage to using a pusher over, say, a lever in certain situations. Let's say you've got this classic trick where you've got the line of dominoes that falls over one way and then topples backwards and you want to have the last domino react something as it falls into position. You're going to have a hard time making a lever that won't get trapped underneath the domino as it falls, but with a pusher, it works like a charm. Number four, speed bump. A speed bump is a small bump on a track or some kind of surface that is used to hold an object. In this example, the speed bump is in front of the ball and it provides enough resistance to hold the ball while it's at rest, but the falling domino provides enough energy to push the ball over the speed bump and let it roll down the track. One of the advantages of a speed bump is that to make it more powerful, you just make it bigger. And this is actually really easy to do with layers of tape. Personally, my go-to method for making a speed bump is adding a small dot of hot glue which is another viable option. Another interesting application of the speed bump is to completely reverse it. So you move the track instead of the ball and then let the ball's own momentum push it over the speed bump when the track comes to a stop. The possibilities really start to open up when you start to take advantage of the speed bump's most useful quality, which is that the ball can actually roll over the speed bump when it's traveling at full speed. In this case, you can see the ball is being held behind the speed bump at the top of the track but when it rolls over it again, it doesn't offer any resistance at all. The speed bump also has a very important alternate application, which is that it can control the movement of balls that aren't in use. So here we have a ball that rolls across the table and hits a domino, but there's nothing controlling its movement after that point. It's free to roll wherever. And on a blank table, this isn't much of a problem, but you can imagine that this could be problematic if there were other things around that it could hit. So here's where the speed bump comes in. The ball is able to roll over the speed bump on its way to the domino, but the domino takes away so much of its speed that it's now trapped in this little container that we've built out of small bumps. All right, next on our list is a very simple mechanism, but an absolutely essential one to know. The track transition barrier. Arguably the two most common machine materials are balls and tracks. And just about the only way that that can go wrong is like this. So yeah, the solution is, let's say, self-explanatory, but adding the proper barriers to your machine to control the range of motion of the free moving objects as much as possible is super important. And it goes such a long way towards reliability and in a lot of cases, aesthetics. And the track transition barrier, as simple as it is, is one of the most fundamental ways of doing that. Moving right along, we're gonna take a look at a mechanism that's very similar to the track transition barrier, the end of track stopper. So sometimes when you have a ball transition from one track to another, even when you do use a track transition barrier, you still might have these random occurrences where the ball almost rolls off the back of the second track. And sometimes it actually happens. Again, the solution to this is very basic, almost intuitive even, but the point of these mechanisms is not to be complicated. In most cases, the simpler the better, really. The point is to provide a comprehensive list of the techniques you need to make a machine. And this very well may be a problem that you run into and a good technique to keep in mind. Another application for the end of track stopper is when you use a string pull combined with a really light ball, like let's say a marble. You might run into a case where the string is actually powerful enough to pull the marble out of the track. And of course the solution here is to add a barrier behind the marble that the string can pass through, but not the marble. So end of track stopper is an all encompassing name that basically just means keep the ball on the track on both ends. So I think it's time to introduce the other species of end of track stopper. 
the little barriers that keep a ball on the track even after it knocks a weight off the table. Without an end of track stopper, you can just have the ball roll down the track, knock the weight off the table, and then fall off the table itself. But usually by just adding a small barrier, you can actually prevent the ball from rolling off the table. And this will make your machine look a lot more clean and a lot more polished. And if you dedicate yourself to preventing every ball in your machine from rolling off the end of the track, you will have to get pretty creative with what kind of barriers you add. So here are some examples of different forms of the end of track stopper that you might need with different balls on different tracks. In certain cases, the end of track stopper can actually solve two problems at once. Let's say you've got a track that's too sloped for the weight to actually stay at the end. If you add an end of track stopper and secure it in such a way so that it's you know, parallel to the floor, what you've effectively done is created a platform to hold the weight that also doubles as an end of track stopper. Number seven, track funnel. A track funnel is a small opening in a track that is the exact width of the ball, so that the ball is only barely able to make it through. What this does is slows the ball down to basically a stop, so that once it passes through the track funnel, its speed and direction are more consistent. So here's a situation in which you might need a track funnel. You've got a large bridge that the ball has to make it over, but it doesn't have any guide rails, so the ball keeps falling off. But if we add two vertical pillars right at the start of the bridge, we can control the movement of the ball so that once it passes through, we can be sure it's going in a straight line. And this allows the ball to make it over the bridge with no problem. This is a mechanism that I used liberally in 8-Ball Machine. Every one of the beer balls has to pass through a track funnel as it enters its holding cell, or else it would have fallen off the rails every single time. In a more general sense, the track funnel can also take the form of these triangular guide rails that, well, funnel a ball to a specific location. And of course, using a track funnel like this doesn't have to be done on a table or on the floor. It could just be a small elevated platform, like in this example from Domino's versus Machines Round 7. Obviously, balls are not the only objects that move in chain reactions, so the track funnel can take care of some other things too. For instance, you can use one to make sure that the wheels of a rolling platform end up in the right place. Number eight, the slider. Now, I have these really nice long metal rods that I use to make sliders, but I understand that not everybody has those, so I will say up front, connects work fine, it's just that you're massively limited by how long you can make them. I've found that sliders are most useful for two main things. The first is creating a vertical pulley system, and the second is for pulling a small platform along at a very consistent speed in a straight line. Honestly, not much more to say about this one, just that the options are wide open for what you can use it for. I mean, these are just some examples, but you can imagine that there are so many other things that you can slide around. Number nine, magnetic connection. There are lots of different forms that the magnetic connection can take, and we'll look at them, but in general, the magnetic connection is any technique that uses the connective or repellent force between two magnets to accomplish a specific motion or a specific goal. In this first example, let's say you've got a trick where you have a track that rotates on its central axis, but it's not quite lining up right with a second track. Well, one of the most common uses for a magnet is to catch and stop an object in a specific position, regardless of how fast it's going when it gets there. And you can see that if we add a magnet to the rotating track and to the track that it's supposed to line up with, we can get it to stop in the perfect position very easily. Another use for magnets is to catch an object in an unnatural position, so to speak. Basically, a position other than its natural resting place. You'll see what I mean. Take a look at this ball dropper here. We need a way to hold the cup in this kind of upside down position to allow it enough time for the ball to roll out. And of course, that's exactly what a magnetic connection is perfect for. Moving on to our third example, we're gonna take a look at another advantage of using a magnetic connection and another problem that it can solve. We've got this rolling platform here that rolls down the slope and completes a secondary path. But you'll notice that it doesn't stay where we want it when it meets the barrier, it bounces back. And you guessed it, the magnetic connection is perfect for addressing this problem too. Simply by adding one magnet to the train and to the barrier, we can completely remove any bounce back. So far, we've seen examples of how you can use magnets to solve problems, but you can use magnets for a lot of other things, so let's take a look at some examples of what else magnets can do. One of my favorite things to use magnets for is actually as a release mechanism. If you start with the magnets connected and then pull them apart, you can release an object that way. Like here, we've got a magnet on the end of the ruler and on the end of this lever, and when the lever moves, the magnets disconnect, allowing the ruler to swing. 
Working with magnets is not always a seamless experience though, so let's take a look at some problems that you might run into while working with magnets and how you can fix them. The first and most obvious example is that sometimes the magnetic force might just be too strong. Here's an example where we're, again, using a magnet as a release mechanism, but this time to release the train down the track. From this first test, we can tell that the magnets are too strong, and in fact the lever doesn't even move at all. And the first thing we might try is pulling the magnets apart with more force by increasing the weight that pulls on the lever. And that might work, or you could cause a different problem. Instead, what you can do is add a small bit of material in between the magnets. Personally, I like to use a small piece of popsicle stick and just glue it to one of the magnets, but you can use whatever materials you have. Obviously, what this is doing is essentially weakening the connective force of the magnets by adding just a little bit of extra distance between them. And interestingly enough, if you're precise and careful enough with the way that you set it up, you can actually do a magnetic release without the magnets even touching. I'm serious, I'm not just showing you this because it looks cool. I mean, I think it does, but this is genuinely a technique that I've used before in a machine to solve this exact problem. Another really cool property of magnets is that when they get close together, they snap into place. And again, if you're careful and precise, that's free energy right there, basically. And you can use this snapping motion, this sudden increase in energy, to give an object a bit of a kick, like a little bit more power. In fact, I used this technique in Keyfinder to practically launch a ping pong ball up a whiteboard. The property that makes magnets so useful for catching objects in very specific, precise positions is the same property that makes magnets so useful for removing objects from the machine in order to reset them more easily. Here's a trick that uses a bunch of marbles. And if you don't think ahead, this is a miserable trick to reset. But if you use magnets, you can actually remove an entire element of the machine, in this case the cup, just for the reset. And when you put it back, you can be sure that you're putting it back in the exact same spot. You can imagine how useful this would be if you're dealing with, not marbles, but liquid of some kind. So far, we've only been looking at ways of using the connective force between magnets, but there's a lot of potential for ways of using the repellent force between magnets to your advantage. If you take two magnets that want to repel each other and secure them in a position where they're basically touching, when you release them, the repelling force is going to give you an extra speed boost basically for free. Number 10, track pendulum. The track pendulum is a weight that hangs above a track that slows down a ball by scraping along the top of the ball as it rolls underneath, usually used before a ball goes around a turn. Here's basically a perfect situation in which you would use a track pendulum. You've got a ball that's going too fast to get around the turn. You can of course make a track pendulum in any number of ways. Personally, I would probably just use connects, but here's an example of one that doesn't use any connects. So those are the basics, and that's it for episode one. In episode two, we're gonna be looking at basic connects techniques. And if the episode's out by now, you can click right here to watch it. If you liked the video, leave a comment down below telling me what you thought. And if you wanna to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss the next episode, you can click right here. I'm Jack of All Spades 98, and I'll see you in the next video.